mountains, rising waters, there is a, a certainty in knowing you. There's even in tumultuous times, there's a constant of your love and your grace and your mercy. So, Lord, I pray that we're reminded of that today. Heavenly Father, I pray for those who are in the path of, of uh, Irma and are being affected right now, our brothers and sisters in Florida. Heavenly Father, I pray for those who are are there trying to take care of folks like uh, our friend Barb's sister. Lord, that was forced to work in the shelter because she works for the school district. And then she reported this morning that there's 2,000 people there and 20 people working in the shelter to take care of them. Heavenly Father, we pray that your hand would be on those folks. Heavenly Father, we also pray that that in the, even in the midst of the storm, they would understand that you're in control. That their help comes from you. Lord, I pray that your church would be your hands and your feet when this is said and done. And that just like in Harvey, that they would reach out and embrace the communities that are affected with loving arms as a testimony of your love for us. Heavenly Father, I pray that in the time that we have together today, Lord, that our hearts would be open and that we would receive whatever it is that you would have us to receive gladly. Lord, that we would enact, put it into action into our lives. That we wouldn't just be hearers of the word, but doers also. Lord, I know that when I look around this room, I see lots of empty seats. Seats that are there to hold people that need to hear your word. We pray, Lord, that we would be an inviting church. A church that invites people to come and experience the, the things that you give to us each and every day. And each and every week, that we would invite people into a relationship with you, that we wouldn't just invite them to church, that we would invite them into a relationship with you. And Lord, I pray that we would, we would live lives that would be testimonies to your great love and what you've done for us. Lord, thank you for the cross. Thank you for reminding it, reminding us of it this morning. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. God's certainly still in the miracle business, isn't he? If you have your Bible, turn to 1 Samuel chapter 25. 1 Samuel chapter 25. Now we've been talking about this series that we've been doing uh, about uh, when relationships collide and um, what our responsibility is in the conflicts and uh, how to resolve conflicts with uh, fellow believers and, and how to, to, to be there for each other and all that kind of thing. Uh, in the first week, we talked about how Jesus is our common ground. We talked about how it's uh, not about us. We talked about the power of contentment. And we talked about the fact that we don't have to die on every hill, but there is one hill, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Last week, that is the hill that we die on. And this week's sermon is entitled an unlikely advocate an unlikely advocate and one of the things that i notice and uh we do this a lot and I, when i talk with christians i can give you example after example where a lot of times we get into this um when we're in the middle of the conflict we get into this kind of shelter mode where we won't accept any uh feedback from the outside and Books have been written about companies that have been destroyed by people that were in charge and wouldn't accept the feedback from outside sources and stuff like that. And we won't listen to people who love us and have our own best interest at heart. Inevitably, when we do that, the result is disaster. And the story we're going to look at today, it's a story where somebody steps in and keeps a bad situation from getting worse. So let's look at First Samuel chapter 25. We're going to start in verse 14. And it talks about there's two people that uh, are at odds with each other here. And one is a guy by the name of Nabal. And 
Nabal has a wife named uh, Abigail, right? And the other person that we're, that we're going to be talking about, Nabal and David, are the ones that are at conflict. And Abigail is going to step in, and we'll talk about that in just a minute. But this is what it says. It says in verse 14, But one of the young men told Ab Abigail, Nabal's wife, saying, Behold, David sent messengers from the wilderness to greet our master, and he scorned them. Yet the men were very good to us, and we were not insulted, nor did we miss anything, as long as we went about with them while they were in the fields. They were a wall to us both night, both by night and by day. All the time we were with them, tending the sheep. Now therefore, know and consider what you should do, for evil is plotted against our master and against all his household, and he is such a worthless man that no one can speak to him. Now what we're going to be looking for in, in, this, uh, in the scriptures that we're going to be um, talking about today is there are four things in this that we're going to pull out that help us to know when it is that we should step into a bad situation. Now, what you have here is the king of Israel coming to Nabal and his men. And Nabal scorns them, right? He's, a, he's, a, he's already embittered, and if you read uh, ahead, if you read behind of what we just where we just started reading, you find out that this guy's a rich guy. He's a guy who has gotten his his uh, his his money, his his wealth through sordid gain. He's cheating people out of money and everything else. He's just not a nice dude. You know what I mean? People know like people like that in our lives. You probably think of people that are probably famous nationally uh, right now. But that's the kind of guy that this is. He's somebody who cares mostly about his riches. Not so much about his reputation. He treats his servants like dirt. And he's a bad dude. David sends an envoy out to, to talk to him. And he scorns them. He insults them by the way that he treats them. And in doing so, incites the wrath of David. Right? He incites the wrath of David. David. And Abigail steps in. And is the voice of reason. And so we're going to look at four things that help us to know when it's time to step in. Because sometimes in the life of a Christian, even though the, the, you're not directly involved in a conflict, you should step in. Amen? Sometimes, even though you're not involved directly in a conflict, it's your responsibility to step in. And here's how to know. Uh, here are four things that will help us know when to do that. The first thing that I want to point out is, that we have to know that sometimes even godly people can be wrong. Amen? Sometimes even godly people can be wrong. Look at verse 17. It says, Now therefore know and consider what you should do, for evil is plotted against our master and against all his household, and he is such a worthless man that no one can speak to him. If we fast forward to verse 38 and read what 38 says, it says, About ten days later, the Lord struck Nabal and he died. So what we can take from this is that this guy probably deserved to die. Amen? He probably deserved to die. He's probably such a bad character and such a bad actor that he's earned the, the criticism that he's gotten and the, the, the downright hatred that some people have of him. He has earned the anger of David. But David still didn't have the right to take his life. Amen? He didn't have the right to take his life. So, Abigail steps in. And we see this in verse 26. She says, essentially, that she is um, saving David from a blood guilt. Which means that he would have been in the wrong if he had tried to take Nabal's life, or if he had taken Nabal's wife's life. So I'll tell you, just to kind of catch you up and kind of backtrack just a minute. So what happens is, after David's, you know, ticked off because, you know, his people are scorned, he sends in a group of 400 men that are intent on, and he leads them, 400 men that are intent on killing Nabal. Abigail comes in. And when she comes in, she comes and she meets David personally. 
and she gets off the animal that she's riding. She gets down on her face and takes all the blame and says, you can blame it all on me. You know, don't blame it on him. And in doing so, David relents, saving the bull's life at that moment, right? Because Abigail stepped in. Now, David, at this point, even, even with Abigail stepping in, he could have justified killing the ball. Amen? He's the king of Israel. Right? As the king of Israel, he deserves a little respect. So he could justify taking this man's life for sure. Especially after he's been dealt with in such a harsh way. His, his people that he sent as an envoy to talk to David have been dealt with in such a harsh way. He could easily justify killing him. But he doesn't. Because it's clearly not in David's best interest. You know how many times that we do things that we, we think are the right thing to do? Sometimes we think it's the right thing to do. And we treat people um, a certain way because we believe it's the right thing to do. But it's clearly the wrong thing and it's not in our best interest. That happens all the time in our life. It happens to us. Uh, uh, I, I see it on social media, by the way, some of us. Because a lot of times what happens is somebody wrongs us. And then we feel justified in wronging them back. You know what I mean? So they say something or they do something that offends us. Then we take it out on them on social media or we take it out with their family. We tell people about it. We, we run around behind their back talking about what they've done to us, getting people on our side and all that kind of stuff. And we feel completely justified in doing so because they wronged us, remember? But we forget that vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. David, remember, is the giant slayer. He's intent on killing this guy. Amen? He's intent on killing this guy. He's the giant slayer, the chosen of the Lord, the king. But I got news for you. David's not always right. If you need more proof, go read about Bathsheba. Right? Godly people can be wrong, and it happens a lot. I'll give you another example. Remember last week we talked about the fact that Paul had to confront Peter because Peter was in the wrong. Amen? Now, if David had succeeded in his mission, we have to think about what would be the outcome. The ball loses his life, right? Let's read verse 23. It says, When Abigail saw David, she hurried and dismounted from her donkey and fell on her face before David and bowed herself to the ground. She fell at his feet and said, On me alone, my Lord, be the blame. And please let your maidservant speak to you and listen to the words of your maidservant. Please do not let my Lord pay please do not let my Lord pay attention to this worthless man, Nabal. For as his name is, so is he. Nabal is his name, and folly is with him. But I, your maidservant, did not see the young men of my Lord whom you sent. Now, therefore, my Lord, as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, since the Lord has restrained you from shedding blood and from avenging yourself by your own hand, now then let your enemies and those who seek evil against my Lord be as Nabal. Now let this gift which your maidservant has brought to my Lord be given to the young men who accompany my Lord. Please forgive the transgression of your maidservant, for the Lord will certainly make for my Lord an enduring house because my Lord is fighting the battles of the Lord and evil will not be found in all in you all your days. Skip down to verse 32. It says, Then David said to Abigail, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel who sent you this day to meet me and blessed be your discernment and blessed be you who have kept me this day from bloodshed and from avenging myself by my own hand. Nevertheless, as the Lord God of Israel lives, who has restrained me from harming you, unless you would come quickly to meet me, surely there would not have been left, there would not have been left to Nabal until this morning light as much as one male. So David received from her hand what she had brought him and, and, and said to her, Go up to your house in peace. See, I have listened to you and granted your request. If she doesn't step in in that moment, then David, full of anger, full of hatred, and in the flesh, is going to go kill Nabal. And not just Nabal, everybody in Nabal's house. Amen? 
in doing so, David would have been in the wrong. Because he's trying to avenge himself. He's trying to defend himself, his reputation. That's a position of pride. Are you ever in the right if you're coming from a position of pride? Not according to my Bible. Right? See, we spend so much time defending ourselves. So much time defending ourselves that we don't stop to listen to others. And this goes for the most, you know, spiritually mature saints. Do the same thing. You know what I mean? If David and Peter can be wrong, then so can the godliest of the saints. Amen? The second thing that we need to consider, the second thing that we need to pull out is that we have to consider the consequences of the situation. Again, in verse 14 through 17, it, it shows us that David's sending 400 men to dispatch Nabal and all his house. The consequences are that not only the Nabal is going to be the one that pays the price, but all of Nabal's servants. Think about that for a second. Is that righteous? Is that justified? No. The only one who showed any uh, contempt for the king is Nabal. That's the only one. Yet all these other guys, even the guys who, who were nice to David's men and showed them around and helped them and, you know, while they're out watch, doing the sheep thing and, you know, doing their thing, those guys are innocent, yet they're also going to die if David has his way because he's bringing 400 men with him. It's not like just David's going to show up and just, you know, assassinate the guy like a ninja. It just means war, right? This is war. He's bringing 400 dudes. And he even says, he says, I'm going to kill him and all his house. All his house. They were innocent. But they were about to suffer the consequences of Nabal's folly and David's wrath. The problem with the situation is that they couldn't convince Nabal otherwise. They couldn't convince him to change his mind. And we see in verse 17, the reason is because he's a worthless man. He won't listen to anybody. Amen? See, we're supposed to have a multitude of counselors in our lives that are speaking into us that's giving us feedback, honest feedback, you know? But one of the first things we do when we're involved in sin is we shut those down. We shut those down, and it happens all the time. I could give you five examples right now without even having to think about it of people that I've come in contact with in this church that have had this issue. I can name for you another five times without even taking a breath the times that I've been that person. Right? That we just shut down. We just shut down. We don't want to hear it. We don't want to hear it from the other side. One of the things that I hear a lot is, you know, well, I didn't tell you about it because I knew you'd lecture me. It's not a lecture. It's love. It's an expression of love, you know, telling people what they need to hear in this moment. Now, Abigail approaches this much differently than I approach things most of the time. She approaches it with grace and humility, you know what I mean? And it may be in the approach, but a lot of times we shut people down. They couldn't convince the ball otherwise because he had already put up those walls. In verse 17, it says he's a worthless man. Something has to change in this situation where some innocent people are going to be hurt and killed. This is sometimes the reason that we need to step in and seek to influence situations to spare the innocent. You know, a lot of times in conflicts involving people in the church, it's clear who's at fault and who's not. And it's our responsibility, it's your responsibility in your life to step in and understand the consequences that those people may be hurt. A lot of times when people are at odds in their marriage, the last thing that they consider is their children, who are innocent bystanders, who didn't ask to be brought into this world. Amen? They didn't ask to. If they did, it would be hard, a lot harder to get abortions in the United States. You know what I mean? But they don't. It's our act that brings them in to being. It's our act that God uses us to create life. Not kids didn't have any choice in it. They didn't get to pick who their parents were. Right? 
But sometimes we get into get in such a, a disagreement, such a bitterness and rivalry and everything else that comes along with it and hold each other in such contempt that we completely forget about the kids. And I'm going to tell you, church, it's our, it's our job on behalf of the children to step in and help save these marriages. It is. It's our job to do uh, what Dee talked about just a minute ago, and that is that we pray for those people. And when we pray, we expect a miracle. We pray for miracles because we believe that God's still doing miracles. Now, there is a jug, there's, there's this understanding, and here's what a lot of people have a lot of, have some problem understanding, is that on one hand, you understand that God's sovereign. His will's going to be done. Amen? Everybody understands that. And then on the other hand, you got the, the fact that you can pray to that God who is sovereign and that His will sometimes changes based on prayer. Some people don't understand that. I'll give you an example. I'll give you an example. Nineveh. God changed His mind. Amen? He was, he was bent on their destruction if they did not repent. That's what he said he was going to do. If Nineveh doesn't repent, I'm destroying the place. Right? So he sends Noah. Now, if God knew that Nineveh was going to repent, would he have to say things like, I'm going to destroy them if they don't? No. That wouldn't make any sense. Right? So, the, the Bible literally says, God changed his mind. Now, I don't understand how all that works. I'm going to be the first one to tell you how an all-knowing, all-loving God can change His mind, but His Word says that He does. It also says that the prayers of a righteous man avail much. Amen? How many times in Scripture do people pray and God hears them? God hears their prayer. Nehemiah has to ask Him to. Right? Jonah, when he's in the pit of the, the, the belly of the whale... The, the big fish, whatever you want to call it. Jonah's in the belly of that whale. He's crying out to God. God hears his prayer. One of the first things that you hear a lot in the Old Testament when people are praying is, Oh Lord, hear my prayer. Right? So we pray. We pray for miracles. We pray for God to intercede in relationships that are broken. How do we do so? In humility. Knowing that he's sovereign. Amen? Now, some people don't understand the sovereignty of God. You don't understand the sovereignty of God. There is literally nothing beside Him. No one beside Him. He's holy. There's no one on His level. And it's not even close. Amen? Do you realize? No, I don't think you understand. Do you realize that every time you take a breath, you're still in his air? I love that. Yeah, we're for real. Every time you take a breath, it's because he allows it. Amen? Every time that sun comes up is because God made it so. Every time the grass does, and the trees do photosynthesis and produce oxygen for us, it's because God made it so. Amen? Literally, he controls everything. He's God. Now, I understand that it's hard for us to understand, but he's literally God. It, that means that you can't come from a place of pride when you talk to him. Amen? You're not on his level. Where do you, where, what is the position that you come from? The same position that Abigail comes from when she confronts King David. How does she do it? She gets on her face before God. Amen? Man, if we would just understand that, your your walk would change. Your walk with God would change dramatically. You begin to see more stuff God is doing. If you humble yourself and trust Him, Amen. Listen, sin always wants to grow. Let me say that one more time. Sin always wants to grow. That's what it wants. It's like a fire and it wants to grow. It wants to expand. It wants to destroy and get stronger. 
That's what sin wants to do. And if nothing changes, that's what happens. Ed Stetcher said that nothing will change until the pain of staying the same outweighs the pain of changing. Do you understand that? That basic concept? That nothing will change until the pain of staying the same outweighs the pain of changing. Conflict, confrontation, and change hurt. But the pain of staying the same grows unless we understand that and it moves us to action. Action. What are the actions? I'm going to tell you your first action should be on your knees. Your first action should be on your knees. You should be actively praying for people that are in the midst of, of conflict, that are in the midst of their relationships colliding. You should be praying on their behalf. Because they're probably not doing it in the, you know, themselves. Some party's not. That's involved. Praying for them. Then you step in. And that looks different for different situations. In Abigail's situation, it was the she packed up her things for a journey got on her animal, and rode to meet the king and put herself in a very vulnerable situation. And that's the third thing that we have to take out of this about uh, stepping into situations where relationships are colliding. It's third that we have to be willing to take a risk, even at great, great cost to ourselves. Read verse 23 again. It says, When Abigail saw David, she hurried and dismounted from her donkey and fell on her face before David, and bowed herself to the ground. She fell at his feet and said, On me alone, my Lord, be the blame. And please let your maidservant speak to you and listen to the words of your maidservant. Please do not let my Lord pay attention to this worthless man. She is interceding on Nabal's behalf. And the way that she's doing that costs her a great deal. First of all, for her to go on that, that journey, it probably took some rations you know she probably had to take some food with her some something to drink she's got to pack that up that takes time amen sometimes when we get involved with people's conflicts sometimes when relationships are colliding it may cost us our time in her case it also may cost her some food it costs her animals some energy it costs her some vulnerability because when she gets off the donkey the first place she goes is on her face that is the most vulnerable position that you can possibly be in, and especially in front of a warrior king who your husband just ticked off. You know what I mean? David said that he's going to take out him and his whole house. Abigail's in his house. You think she felt safe? No, but she took the risk at great cost to herself. She's the one who made the move to talk to David. She's the one who humbled herself before him. She's the one who took all the blame. Listen, if we're going to step in, it's going to cost us a lot. It may cost you your time. It may cost you your reputation. It may cost you money. It may cost you status. But it's worth it if it's godly, if God's directing it. And I'm going to tell you, that's happened to me in ministry in, in this church. There have been people who have come to me or that I've, I've went to them because something's happening in their relationship, and so I meet with them. It's happened with husband and wives. I meet with them, and they talk about their distress, the things that they're going through, and then I help them through that. And then afterwards, the shame of seeing me and knowing that I know the things that I know is overwhelming, so they leave. And you know what happens when they leave? They demonize me. They go around telling stories about me and stuff like that. Maybe some of you guys don't even know that that's ever happened because I, I, I rarely share that kind of thing. But it's happened. And I don't regret a single time that I intervene and help somebody save their marriage by using God's Word and praying for that couple. I can tell you of at least three times that that's happened in this church. But listen, I don't feel the need that I have to go around and mop up their messes when they're saying things about me that aren't true. I don't feel the need that I have to. Why? Because i got a defender that's way better than me. You know what I mean? I'm more interested in defending him. If it saves their marriage, there have been times when I've helped people through, you know, counseling and stuff like that, that there's been at least one time where I came, I became the common denominator that held them together because I was the common enemy. Whatever it takes. I'm down with that. 
You know what I mean? If it saves their marriage, it's God's will. Sometimes it costs us. Sometimes it definitely costs you your time. It may cost you your reputation. It may cost you your status. But it's worth it if God's driving you to it. And here's the thing that we, the, the only way that we're able to do that, if we trust in God's sovereignty. The only way that we're able to do that and say, God, I'm going to step in, but it's going to cost me and it's going to be rough, is if we trust in God's sovereignty. Because here's the thing that I know beyond a shadow of a doubt. No matter what, He's going to take care of me. Amen? I trust in His Word, His, His promises, that all things are going to work together for my good and His glory. Why? Because I am the call of the Lord. You know what I mean? So we trust in God's sovereignty. We trust Him to be Him and leave that up to Him. He's worth defending. I'm not. So, that's what we do. The fourth thing is, and this is this kind of piggybacks on that last thing, and this is the last point. I'm trying to go pretty quickly here. The fourth thing is that we have to seek God's glory over our own. Let me say that again because I think it's the most important thing. We must seek God's glory over our own. Now that's tough to get people to understand in a culture that we live in today. It is. You notice the first thing that David does after Abigail has her say, verse 32. It says, Then David said to Abigail, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel. The very first thing he does, the very first thing out of his mouth, because she has stepped in and shown him the error of his thinking, the error of his ways. She steps in and in, in, in her humility, in her grace, in her love. She steps in and does so in such a way that as soon as she's done talking, David steps back and he, he takes a minute, right, to bless God. That's the first thing out of his mouth is he blesses the Lord. You notice then the next thing he does, verse 33, and blessed be your discernment and blessed be you. He blesses her. He blesses God. He blesses her. Right? And her wisdom, her discernment, who have kept me this day from bloodshed and from avenging myself by my own hand. Avenging himself by his own hand would have been sinful. So he, not only does he bless the Lord, but he confesses his sin right, in the, right out the gate. This is what we're after, amen? This is the optimal outcome of a situation like this. This is what we're going for. Because I know that blessing God and repenting of your sin gives God glory. Does it not? I know it does. Or he wouldn't preach about it so much in his word. For that to happen, for us to have that kind of an outcome, the very first thing that you got to do when you're interceding in a relationship, whether it's colliding with another relationship, is to check your motives. Why are you stepping in? Is it so that people look at you and say, oh, they're such an awesome person? Or is it because you want God's glory? You know, that's a legit question. I'm going to tell you, that's one that I ask myself a lot of times. Why are you doing this, Josh? Are you doing this for you? Are you doing this for the Lord? Now, that the, it's easy to justify sometimes when you're doing church stuff. You know what I mean? Like if I, like if, if I was the one organizing the, the Harvey Relief, you know, you could be doing that out of glory for yourself. You know what I mean? It's real easy to do and justify it because it's a godly thing to do. But you got to check your motives because God's not going to bless the things that are there to pump, to prop you up. As a matter of fact, His Word says, that if that's your motivation, then whatever pats on the back you get down here, that's your rewards. Listen, that ain't enough. That's not a good enough reward. I want to be storing up treasures in heaven, right? That's where I want my rewards. So how do you do that? I'll tell you how. And that is to seek His glory and not your own. Here's the conclusion. Romans 5.8 says, so while Jesus, while, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Did you understand, you understand that we had an issue between us and God? Right? We have an issue between us and God, the things called sin. Amen? And that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He stepped into our desperate situation at great cost to himself. And in doing so, 
He brought glory to God by bearing our sin. And now we can be reconciled to God. Jesus stepped in. Amen? So we need to. We need to step in. Do you see the gospel in that? See, that's that's what we call applying the gospel to your life. Right? It's not just enough to pray a prayer. you got to apply the gospel to your life. So when you're in a situation where two people are, are in a dispute and you're an outside party and God's leading you to do it, He's telling you you need to step in. That is, that is the, the gospel coming out in your life because you're going to step into that situation just like Jesus stepped into our situation. Amen? It's going to cost you. It costed Him. It cost Him. It cost Him. Cost him. Yeah, I know. Cost him. Right? But if you're doing it to give God glory, it will bring God glory. And that's our ultimate goal is to bring God glory. God, God's glorified through reconciliation. Did you understand that that's our ministry? That's what the New Testament tells us. It tells us that our, if we have a ministry of reconciliation, reconciling people to God. Amen? So we ought to be pros at it. But instead, a lot of times we see something and we're like, we're not involved in that and we balk. Right? We stand pat. Right, well, I'm getting out of that one. I'm not going to jump in that situation. We just let them fight it out and hope we make it out the other side, right? That's not what we're called to do. We're called to bring people together. You understand that we have the most powerful force on earth that, that has the ability to do that? Jesus Christ. Love. Even Satanists understand that. You know that, right? Aleister Crowley was a Satanist. And even he understood the fact that, I mean, he, this is a quote directly from him. He said, love Love is the only bond that can unite the divided. All else is a curse. Now, what he didn't understand is God is love. We understand that. Amen? So give him love. God's glorified when you do. So I ask you, is it time for you to step in? Is it time for you to step in? We're going we're gonna to close in prayer in just a second. We're going to pray. And if you need to come forward, you come forward. But I think one of the... Are you raising your hand or are you stretching? Okay. Yeah. That's what I was getting ready to say. That's what we're going to be praying for today. Yeah, I didn't know that at 3 o'clock we were doing it. Absolutely. And that's what we're going to do, and that's what I'm going to open up this invitation. If you need to, to repent, maybe there's a situation God's been calling you to step into and uh, you haven't done that, then it's time to repent and do what God asks you to do. But we have a big situation in front of us right now with Hurricane Irma that we can step in right now. God's calling you to step in right now. Amen. You got the burden, so we got to step in. So I would, I would invite anybody that wants to come forward and pray up here. And I know we've done this like the last two weeks, but it don't get old. And the, the, the altar's still there. So, you know, why not use it? Amen. Amen. So uh, I would just invite Stephen going to come and play a little, uh, just some background music on the piano. And you guys come and pray with me, and we're going to pray, and we're going to pray to God sends that hurricane out of here. And, a, you know, it affects, you know, only the ones that it's already affected and no more. And uh, we're going to pray for that and, and uh, on behalf of the people of Florida. And uh, we're also going to continue to remember Rhonda because we're going to pray till the cancer's gone. And, uh, and we'll pray that it never comes back. And uh, we're going to pray for uh, who else? I know there's somebody else. Denise prayer. I know Darlene was in the hospital this week, so let's remember Darlene Garrett in prayer. Norman Holbrook, yes, pray for Norman. Who else? Houston, yeah, yeah, definitely Houston. And for those that are going to be going down there, next week and probably the week after, we'll probably take up a love offering to help with uh, gas and stuff like that for the people that are going. So if anybody wants to contribute to that, you know, just know that that's coming. Uh, but yeah, let's pray. Let's 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 really pray that God intervenes here. So would you come forward now and let's pray together.